While walking down a memory lane of past so long ago, old Satan came right by my side, making me feel low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Well, I heard the old accuser, and this was my reply. You're right for all those things I've done. I sure deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags. My goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you've said to me. It's under the blood. Oh, praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life has been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. Victory was given me when I was born again. He walked my stained and sinful path and put new life within. No longer do I bear the mark that sin had brought my way. With happiness and peace of mind, praise God I now can say. It's under the blood, oh praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be, my life has been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame, it's already gone. I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. Let's try that together. It's under the blood. Oh, praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life has been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. I'm glad it's under the blood, man. All right, so that other one must not have been the will of God. That's how we do it. That had taken the blame, which is well, it must. <laughs> <coughs> help in here okay he counts the stars one and all knows how much sand is on the shore sees every sparrow that falls he made the mountains and the sea he's in control of everything of all creatures great and small he knows my name Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. When overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, because he knows my name. Don't know what tomorrow will bring. I can't tell you what's in store. I don't know a lot of things. Don't have all the answers to the questions of life. But I know whom I have believed. And he knows my name. Every step that I take. Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, and he knows my name. When overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, 
Cause he knows my name Every step that I take Every move that I make Every tear that I cry He knows my name I'm glad he knows my name I knew his name Long time Took it in vain many times But then that morning That morning I put my faith and trust in what he did And I didn't just get forgiven from hell I became a child of God. I got born again. And uh, boy, what a ride. What a ride it has been. Open your Bible to Psalm 138 this morning. Now, that preacher, uh, before he preached, I went to a service and I heard the gospel and heard about hell. And I'm in solitary confinement at the time for starting a riot. They said it was a riot. It was just a fist fight. And uh, I said, hey, man, you got one of them Bibles? Because I didn't have nothing in my cell. And, uh, and he got a King James Bible up to me. And, um, and I didn't know anything about Bibles, but uh, it was nice. It was about, I said large print. I had issues, and, uh, and it's, I got it still. It's about that big. And it's not an expensive Bible, but it was a King James Bible, large print Bible. In front of it, in the fly leaf, I guess they call it, there was what I'm about to read. And of course, it means a whole lot more to me now than it did then. I might have read it. I don't even remember. But it goes like this. This book reveals the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Uh, its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to sustain you, and comfort to cheer you. Christ is its grand subject, our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. Here, too, is heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, guide the feet, read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth and a paradise of glory. It is given to you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and it will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor and condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. That's a big deal right there. Owned it is riches, studied it is wisdom, trusted it is salvation, loved it is character, obeyed it is power. All that refers to one book. Boy, I tell you what, we got something man. We got some. No wonder the devil's been trying to undermine our confidence in it since Genesis 3. I never heard that before. Mark of the beast is a question mark. That's very true. I've preached that, but I never saw it like that. And I'm going to spread that all over the country, and people are going to think you got it from me next time you said it. Amen. Uh, Psalm 138, verse number 1. That's how it is with evangelism. We hear stuff, and uh, you take it to the masses. It says, I will praise thee, Psalm 138 and verse 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. That's a problem these days. People are praising them, you know, when it's convenient, or uh, one day a week, but not with their whole heart. Uh, before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Boy, I tell you, the Bible talks about there being gods many. And uh, we were coming out of the campground one time, and uh, we are on our way to church by 9.30 Sunday morning, and there was a fitness gym, big one. And there was, I don't know, 75 cars in the parking lot. And my wife looked over and says, well, I see their church today. And that's exactly what that, what that is. And then uh, we've come out of, uh, we've come into places and there'll be a ball stadium. And uh, there'll be hundreds, maybe thousands of people in a, in a professional sports stadium. They're in church. And there's God's many, all right. Uh, before the God will I sing praise unto thee. Verse uh, 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple 
and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Look what it says. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. His name is above every name. And in this verse he says he magnifies his word above his name. Because if he didn't, we wouldn't even know his name. We wouldn't even have anything to say. We just have our opinion or our tradition or our ritual. But because of his word, we can proclaim the name that is above every name. I want to talk to you this morning about your Bible. Thought that might be appropriate to today. I know what you believe. We believe the same. That's why I'm here. Amen? And uh, so let's pray, Father, again we come to you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray and ask the Lord that you bless our service. Uh, continue to. Uh, I don't know everybody here, so I pray if anybody's not sure that they'll spend eternity in heaven, that they'd let us open this precious Bible and show them how they can be sure. I'm sure glad somebody brought the truth to me years ago. And pray and ask, Lord God, that your people might be edified this morning and just renew, uh, refresh, remind them of some things that they certainly already know. But, uh, Lord, maybe I'll say something in a different way. Lord, I love you. Thank you for the gift of eternal life that came at such a great cost. And then thank you not for not just leaving us uh, flounder down here until we see you in heaven. Thank you for giving us the word of God. Thank you for direction and instruction and men that uh, that will preach it, men and women that will live it and be good examples to the rest of us. Help us to all endeavor in that regard. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're talking about the Bible. Let me just say thank God for the Bible. Now, that's an interesting word. It sure gets thrown out, thrown around a lot. It, it is so powerful that it gets used in non-spiritual applications. Uh, long before I gave the Word of God much attention, I was familiar with a book called the Shooter's Bible. Anybody ever heard of the Shooter's Bible? And it's about that thick. It was back in the 70s, about that thick. It was like a catalog. And it was saying by putting Bible on its name that we are the final authority and everything that has to do with ammo, has to do with hunting equipment, has to do with modern firearms. And they're saying they knew because that word Bible means authority and they knew. And they put that on there. And, uh, and uh, so there's a shooter's Bible. I found out there's a fisherman's Bible. There's a fisherman's Bible, same type of thing. It is saying everything you need to know right here. And it introduces new products and all that stuff. There's a boater's Bible. I did some research. What does that mean? I asked the wizard. Wizard, is there any other? <laughs> yeah, Google, you know. And, uh, and uh, there's even a golfer's Bible, which personally, if anybody needs a Bible, it's, no, I don't want to say that. I'm not a golfer. Let's leave it at that. Amen. Uh, that word Bible, I mean, you can go into a, Bookstore, I hesitate to say Christian. You go to a bookstore with Christian art, you know, it, you know they'd be all right if they just wouldn't try to quote scripture with their captions. Uh, they could put a nice picture and a reference, and I'm okay with that. But as soon as they start writing it all in the wrong Bible, I'm not taking it into my house. Just say it. Amen. But uh, uh, you can go to a place like that and say, oh, where's the Bibles? And they'll point you to a rack, and it might be as big as a wall. And you'll see, you'll see 50 different, maybe 100 different books, and they'll all say the same thing on the title. They'll say Holy Bible, and they don't even, they're, they're not even the same as each other, let alone the same as the King James Bible. I'm a King James guy. Uh, no apology for that. So when I say Bible, I'm talking about the uh, inspired, inerrant Word of God, talking about the authorized version of 1611. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why. I, had, I stood in Hampton Court Palace in London <coughs> at the very spot, and they had a little plaque there where King James in 1604 authorized the translation of the of the Word of God from all the compiled manuscripts, and it took seven years, interesting number, and at 1611, we got the uh, King James Bible. Amen. And uh, so I'm talking about that Bible. I'm talking about the King James Bible. Now, you have a different kind of Bible. You know, you do what you want, but I tell you what, uh, my prayer is that you would be convinced somewhere along your journey to get a hold of the real deal. And it is the real deal. All right, so let me tell you some things about it. Now, take your Bible and go to Matthew 7. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7. 
Now, as Christians, I didn't join a, 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 a social club. Uh, when I got saved and got out of jail, I didn't say, oh, I need something else to do because I used to be in a bike gang. And I did, I was, you know, very active. Now I need something to replace that. I'm going to join a Christian club. I didn't join a Christian club. I've had enough clubs to last me the rest of my life. I wanted something real. I was looking for something real back in the paratroopers. I was looking for something real when I was got involved in the one percenter bikers. And all of that let me down. What I really was looking for is what Jesus Christ established in Matthew 16. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. And this is the brotherhood that God intended to fill the void that's within each and every one of us. And as you notice, Satan has a million, probably that's an understatement, a million substitutes that people get involved in, some whole hog, I mean, uh, uh, all the way involved in, and all that's a counterfeit for what he intended for us to get a hold of as members of the Church of the Living God. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. Now, here's why, here's why uh, we're not just a social organization. In verse 24, uh, uh, Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, hear, do. Remember James chapter 1, be a doer, not just a hearer. Uh, he said, uh, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him, uh, liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now, I'd say, that, I'd say this, the Word of God is our foundation. I'm not a construction guy, but I got enough sense to know that if, and the Bible backs it up in the next couple of verses, you can build a structure that may look just as good as the one built on the right kind of foundation, but if it's not, it might look as good, but it might cost as much. But when the storm comes and the rains come and the wind blows, and they do, uh, the Bible says that it won't stand. And in fact, it says here, the, and great was the fall of it. Amen. So religion is like a house built on sand. It can look okay uh, until the rubber meets the road, and that's when the rough stuff comes. And thank God the Bible gives us a foundation that we can rely on. The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. I remember seeing that in a church, maybe down in Mount Airy, uh, when I was a pretty new Christian, they took me down there, and I thought, well, that is one catchy Bible believer slogan right there, final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And uh, But I tell you what, it's way more than just a catchy slogan. It's Bible. It says in Psalm 119 and verse 89, it says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That's pretty final. Amen. That's pretty final. In other words, and uh, I've only been saved 33 years. Your pastor's got me by a couple years, and a lot changed just since I've been saved. A lot changed since, a lot changed since you've been saved. Amen. And uh, I mean, last last 10 years, they were like watching a toilet flush. Man, it's picking up speed before it <laughs> goes out of sight. And uh, I'm just glad there's some things that don't change. Jesus Christ said He's the same. Uh, yesterday, today, and forever. I'm happy about that. And the Bible says, uh, and, and I'm happy to report that the Bible doesn't change. My Bible doesn't change. Amen. Somebody else might get a flyer in the mail about the new, latest, greatest, easier to understand version. What part of all of sin is hard to understand? I mean, I ask prisoners that. Amen. And so uh, thank God for the Bible. It's our foundation. The Bible is our final authority. In all matters of faith and practice. My wife was talking to a lady one time. She gets to do a little counseling. She's been saved 45 years, something like that. And she gets to talk to people. She's got a lot of experience. And, uh, and this is a Christian gal, and she had some issues. And my wife said, well, here's what the Bible said. And she took her to the Bible that addressed that. That's the way we do it. And, uh, and the girl, you know, she claimed to be saved and loved Jesus and believe the Bible. But she said, yeah, well, but. And then she added some more information. She didn't give it first. And then, and then my wife said, well, and she went to another place in the Bible. And that went on for hours, she said. She's way more patient than I am. And every time my wife would show her a Bible principle that addressed whatever it was she was talking about, she would say, yeah, but. And my wife finally just closed the Bible. She said, I can't help you. 
said, the Bible works for everybody except you. I think she's got the drift. And the truth of the matter is, the Bible does work for everybody, but you got to let it. You got to let it. Amen. So I'm happy today. We're not a bunch of cookie cutters. We're not clones. We're not all like that. We're not even supposed to be like that. And we're welcome to have our own thoughts and opinions on, on different things. But at the end of the day, the final authority in all matters of faith and practice is the word of God. Amen. Uh, it says this, John 17. Thank you for putting that up for me. Uh, John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You're in a day and age where we have, we've been lied to by religion, by politics, by Hollywood. We've been lied to for so long. I tell you what, it, a lot of people are just giving up on the fact that there's any truth out there. But I'm happy to report there is, and it's in the word of God. Amen. And it says, thy word is truth. And in a world where you don't know what to believe. I was talking to a guy, well, he came to me up in Rochester, New York one time. And, uh, and he said, hey, Brother Burton, did you hear about this? And it was some kind of conspiracy kook thing. And, uh, and you hear about this? And I'm like, I'm looking at him because I'm ready for that stuff. And, uh, and I didn't say nothing. And he said, oh, no, no, it, it's documented, he said. And he gave me a little more information, and I'm not biting. And he goes, it's documented. It's documented. I said, what, you mean you can read about it on the Internet? That's what he means. Yeah. It's documented. Oh, this isn't just my opinion. This isn't kooky. You can read. And I said, so you actually believe everything on the Internet is true? Is that what I... And uh, he didn't say nothing for a minute. I said, son, if I, if, I, if I knew my Bible as well as you know that junk you're reading, I'd be a better preacher. And then I said to him, and if you knew your Bible as well as that junk you're reading, you'd be a better Christian. He didn't talk to me the rest of the week. I don't know why. I'm glad that I know where to go for truth. Amen. And we mentioned in Sunday school, the Bible is pure. It says in Psalm 119, and verse 40, thy word is very pure. <laughs> Therefore, thy servant loveth it. Amen. And we were going to sing, I love the old Bible, but one of us couldn't seem to get on key. And it wasn't her. Okay, so yeah. And uh, we read the verse earlier. It said, the words of the Lord are pure words. Amen. And outside of a King James Bible, there ain't a pure word, a pure book anywhere. 100%. Bible's pure. Amen. You ought to treasure it. Go to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. And it says this in verse 12. Job 23 and verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, which is the definitive verse that proves that Job was not a Baptist. Amen. We make a lot of big deal out of food, don't we? Amen. Uh, if that I have esteemed the word. That word esteem means to honor and to respect. And Christians were persecuted, uh, imprisoned, burned at the stake, what, a little over 500 years ago? Just prior to us getting the King James Bible, and uh, they, they went through that just so that we could have what we've got all over the room. We need to treasure it more than we do. I got to go to Edinburgh, Scotland, and downtown there's a thing called the Beheading Stone, and it's a tourist attraction. And here's the Beheading Stone where thousands of Christians were executed, for not uh, uh, recanting their faith in Christ alone and returning to the Church of Scotland. And people are standing around getting their pictures taken, smiling, getting their pictures taken around the beheading stone. And I'm standing there in tears. And that's what it costs for us to get where we're at uh, today. And Great Fire Cemetery just outside of Edinburgh, there's a mass grave there, read the big plaque, mass grave there, 18,000. Christians executed. Now, that's what it took. That's the stand people made to break away from Rome and break away from, from organized religion and put their faith in what we call in Jesus Christ plus nothing minus nothing. I say all that say this, man. That book deserves to be esteemed. Amen. It deserves to be uh, honored and treasured. That's, we make a big deal out of it. And it deserves to be a big deal. Amen. 
Uh, we need to love it. You, ought, you do well to love your Bible. Amen? Uh, uh, again, there's that song we did do. I love the old Bible. And it says this, Psalm 119 and verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. The only time great peace shows up in your Bible is right there. And the context is the word of God. Amen. And uh, a world full of turmoil and chaos and apprehension, and that put it mildly compared to the day and age which we live in, loving the word of God will give you great peace in spite of what's going on out there. Out there outside of the church house, out there outside of your house. Amen. Loving the Bible. Now, in light of that verse, it amazes me that sometimes professing Bible believers are the most easily offended people I've ever met. That is a contradiction. Amen. In the old days, in the biker gang world there, we could get mad at each other, get drunk, get mad at each other, go outside, fist fight, and then go back in and continue to drink together. Boy, you look crossways at a Christian these days, and they'll, they'll man, you made an enemy for life. And nowadays with social media, They'll, they'll slander you in front of a lost world. What is wrong with this picture? Amen. You do well love the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4. Say, but Brother Spurgeon, we know all this. I, I, I don't. The Bible gave you pastors and teachers to teach you what you didn't know. The Bible gave you evangelists to bring some things to your remembrance. Amen. We're always looking for something new. I'll tell you what. Maybe the problem is we need to get familiar with the things that are old again. Amen. All right, so uh, uh, Hebrew chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, <coughs> piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know what that makes that book? That makes that book the most powerful force on the planet. And to put it in perspective, we have a nuclear arsenal that's definitely capable of dividing uh, bone and marrow, joints and marrow, but that book can, can uh, divide asunder soul and spirit. There ain't nothing in American uh, a nuclear arsenal that can do that. Amen? That divine power. It said it's a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. That means this. When you're reading that book, it's reading you. Amen? You, you open that book and say, I want to make a denomination on baptism. They'll give you a verse. You say, I want to I wanna, I wanna get a hold of uh, handling snakes. There are verses for it. We were in a church in West Virginia one time, way back, way back, three hollers off the highway, and uh, and the kids said, we had the kids with us back then, and uh, they said, Dad, this is one of them churches where they handle rattlesnakes, is it? And I said, no, no, that's uh, some other crowd. We're, we're Bible. And we go into this church, and over by the pulpit was a white box, about that big, looked like a toy box. And I'm definitely not part of the normal church furniture. <laughs> the kids were in the back making friends and everything, talking. And, and I walk over, I walk over to that box, you know, and I just kind of stand there when no one's looking. And the <laughs> that thing would have started rattling. I'd have got them kids back in that bus. I'm telling you what. Amen. Uh, you go into that Bible with an agenda, and you'll find something in there to back up whatever you want to believe. But I tell you what, you can go to that you can go to that Bible in a jail cell at six o'clock in the morning and we're looking for God, looking for truth, and He'll reveal Himself to you. That's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There ain't nothing like it, man. That's why we're Bible people. Amen. We're not a cult. We're not a clique. We're just Christians that believe the Word of God. Amen. That Bible deserves to be respected. Romans fifteen. Romans chapter 15. Now that Bible there, let me read the verse to you, verse 4. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, 
that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Beloved, that Bible is our source of comfort. In a world that's coming apart at the seams, thank God we know where to go to find comfort. Like I said, nothing in this world makes any sense. But the Bible makes sense. To me, I went in, I got out of the military in 74 and got involved in motorcycle gangs. I took my airborne infantry skills, the only place that, you know, I was qualified and joined the bike gang. And, uh, and uh, this world made no sense. Uh, I think Nixon resigned uh, a week before I got out of the military. Nixon resigned as president. Uh, uh, then they pardoned him. Then Carter gave away the Panama Canal. And I mean, nothing made it. I'm a young guy. I'm a, I'm a soldier. And the world don't make no sense. And I got involved in a motorcycle culture way too deep, way too long. I'll, I'll admit that. And uh, then I got saved 15 years later. And, and now the eye, my eyes are open. I got saved right during Desert Storm. And, uh, and I looked around. I said, this world don't make any more sense now than it did when I, when I went under. The difference between 1974 and 1990 was one thing made sense. And that was Jesus Christ. He, that was the explanation for why the world was like it was. That was the explanation why eat, drink, and be merry is not a philosophy to embrace like I had embraced it. Jesus Christ is our hope. I read the verse. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 and 18, wherefore comfort one another with a what? A hug? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And those words tell us what happens, why it happened, what's going to happen next. And like I say, sorrow is scriptural, but we've got something. We've got a source of hope. Amen? Not as others with no hope. So Bible salvation, listen, Bible salvation is a, is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. I didn't get religion. I don't have any now. Amen. I got saved, did what the Bible said, and I got a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, I just want to say Bible Christianity, because I draw the line there too, because there's a lot of professing Christianity things going on. Bible Christianity is a personal relationship with the Word of God. Amen. Psalm 119 and verse 11 says, Thy word... Have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee? Amen. Richard Wormbrand was, uh, was locked up. A communist locked him up in Romania uh, right after World War II for preaching the gospel. And the man spent 14 years in prison. He spent three years in solitary confinement. No window, no book, no light. Three years. And the guy came out a stronger Christian than he went in. You know why that is? How's that possible? Because he had put the word of God in his heart methodically, faithfully, for years before that time came. Some of us, we tuck it under our arm, we carry it around, we got it one in our glove box and one on our shelf, and we act like it might never go away. But then whenever, uh, like say, that kind of rough stuff comes, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to be able to lead a cellmate to the Lord if it ever came to that? And I don't really think it will in America. But uh, Wormbrand did. Uh, somebody said one time, Brother Spurgeon, why do you think there's so much sin in the camp? And that, you know what that means. In our crowd, man, it's amazing the things that, that we see people do, hear about people do. And that means this, listen, you're capable too. And uh, so that's why we get a hold of this hiding the word of God in your heart. They said, well, Bertie, why do you think there's so much sin in the camp? And I said, well, the answer is kind of obvious. Like, we've got it. We, this is the King James Bible, the inspired word of God. Okay, that's good. Now what are you going to do with it? Now you better learn it. Now you better hide it in your heart. That's the way the Bible says it. Uh, it says in verse 16 there in Psalm 119, I will delight. Myself in its statute, in thy statutes, I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live 
and keep thy word. It's a big deal. Amen. And uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 1 and verse 2 says, uh, but his delight, it starts off by, blessed is the man who walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's, those are three ways not to get in on the blessings of God. And, uh, but then it says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. We're not talking about transcendental meditation. We're talking, you know what meditate means? It means think. It means use your brain. It means when you're reading the Bible, think about what it says. You don't just read through it to put a check mark. Oh, I finished that. You know, think about what it says. Here's a novel concept. Every word in that Bible is there for a reason. Every word. So that you don't blow them off. You don't go through First Chronicles and change the names to Bill and Bob and George. Everything in there, amen, is for a reason. I've seen people do that kind of stuff. Amen. You need to meditate on the Word of God every day. It says day and night. Amen. We should read the Bible every day. My wife loves to read. She reads, 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 reads. Me, I got to force myself. You know, if something comes easy, praise the Lord. If it doesn't, then you got to do it anyway. It doesn't matter whether it comes easy to you or not. I'm giving you a formula for success as a child of God. And uh, and you should say, so some people say, well, I'm not, I'm not good at, that's why they make them little Bible reading schedules. Amen? And a lot of people use those. And you can go through that thing, and it, and it provokes you. Yeah, in a year, it provokes you uh, to, 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 okay, i got to read, you know, show you what to read. I've had people tell us that uh, we had a gal in New York City said she had read her Bible through. She'd been saved 20 years. She'd been read her Bible through, cover to cover, numerous times. But she said, I never read my Bible through in one year till Mrs. Spurgeon gave her this calendar that she had. And I had another one tell me that about a book uh, that was a devotional that had dates on it like that. And that's the kind of stuff that helps people. And if that, you know, if you're like, wake up in the morning, and I can't wait to read my Bible, I can't wait. Good. I wish I was more like that. Amen. Uh, like her. But uh, I get up hungry and she says, not till I read my Bible. I'm going, ah, what? <laughs> Amen. But uh, those of us aren't, well then, do what you got to do. Uh, you do well to delight in it and meditate on it. And you know that proverb a day? Now I'm all for that. Read a proverb a day. There's 31, pro right? 31 proverbs. And somebody said, well, Brother Spurgeon, some days only have 30 days. And I just looked at him like, you're really an idiot, aren't you? I mean, figure it out, okay? Read two. Skip one. I don't care. But there is a wealth of practical knowledge and application in the book of Proverbs. It's an amazing thing. And to read it through uh, in a year, 12 times in a year, amen. It'll help you. It'll help you. But that doesn't qualify for studying your Bible. It's a good thing to do. But you need, I recommend reading the Gospels m many, several times a year just to be reminded of what our Savior did to make a way for our sins to be forgiven. Amen. Amen. Psalm 16. Go to Psalm 16. Talk about the Bible this morning. I like to talk about the Bible. <clears throat> Psalm 16. I'm sure this is purely coincidental. But Psalm 16, verse 11, right? It, that was a pun. Did you get that? Because there ain't no coincidences. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. This world is so fixated on pleasure and and, and all that kind of thing. And the Bible says that uh, real pleasure is at the right hand of God. And in thy presence is fullness of joy. Well, that listen, the closest you're going to get to the presence of Jesus Christ down here is time you spend in your Bible. Amen? And I look at that, maybe uh, some reasons... Uh, one of the reasons Christians lack joy, let alone victory in their life, or, or are so easily caught up in the cares of this life is because they, 
they're spending very little time in his presence. Amen. So I'm just, a kid said, about a seven-year-old kid, seven, eight-year-old kid, says this, uh, they had a Bible at a shelf, you know, and a family Bible, one of the big Bibles. It's up on the shelf. Been there his whole life. And finally one day the kid says, Mom, what, what, what's that? What's that book? And she said, that's, Johnny, that's God's book. And the little kid says, shouldn't we give it back? Nobody around here is using it. Ooh, that mm, cut to the quick right there. Amen. Uh, it, it is, this came to mind a while back, and I was able to find it, and I'm not going to sing it, uh, but I'm going to pretend it's a poem. Uh, maybe you've heard this song. You ever heard that song, I'm using my Bible for a road map? Well, it sounds like Lester Rollout singing or something. Well, yeah, I like that. I'm using my Bible for a road map. The children of Israel used it too. They crossed the Red Sea of Destruction, for God was there to see them through. Uh, how do you know that? Oh, it's in there. Exodus 14, it's in the Bible. And uh, there'll be no detours to heaven, though some rough roads along the way. I'm using my Bible for a road map. My last stop is heaven some sweet day. Can you say that? I'm using my Bible for a road map. Ten commandments, they tell me what to do. The 12 disciples are my road signs. i got to think about that. And Jesus will take me safely through. I already thought about that one. And I, amen. Amen. There'll be no detours to heaven, though some rough roads along the way. I'm using my Bible for a road map. My last stop is heaven. Some sweet day. I like that. Amen. I like that. We're talking about the Bible uh, this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, there in verse 10. A uh, familiar verse, usually, most of us, it says in uh, verse 10. Philippians 2, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That about sums it up. Uh, that makes that one important name, doesn't it? But our verse, our text, Psalm 138, said, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Boy, what's that say about the importance of his word? Amen. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you saved? Are you saved? If you are, it isn't because you're a good person. It isn't because you go to church. It sure isn't because you got baptized. I've been in places where people have been baptized so many times the tadpoles are on a first name basis with them. That ain't going to get you into heaven. Amen. Yeah, if you're saved, I'd say, are you saved? Say, yes, I've never killed anyone. And I've heard all these things. People say, I'm a good person. God wouldn't... Oh, a righteous, loving God would not put people in hell. A righteous, loving God gave His only begotten Son to keep your sin from putting you in hell. Amen? If you're saying this morning, it's because the Bible told you how to be. Amen? If you're not saved, the Bible's got some good news for you this morning. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. That doesn't sound very good. Well, uh, it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we are condemned already, it says in Matthew chapter 3, and the wages of sin is death, but God made a way, boy. So how do you know, Brother Spurgeon? Well, I got a Bible that showed me exactly what he did. And I chose to believe it. It was the best decision I ever made. Amen? For God so loved, listen to the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No confusion about who that is. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? That's the best news you're ever going to hear. You don't have to go to hell. Isn't that good? Amen. Now, you know, this is America, and everybody's concerned with their rights. So I'll say this. You can if you want to. I mean, that's up to you. But God did everything he could to make a way for you not to. And I'll tell you what, he even did, you know, if you can add to what Jesus did, he put a church in Homestead. And whatever everybody else does, I don't know. But I know that here, God burdened a man and woman to come down here and open a Bible to show you you don't have to go to hell. Now, there's places you can go and feel good about yourself and maybe get some counseling and maybe, you know, have a, you know, get some victory over some things in your life. But you get victory over the devil 
get victory over hell by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Plus nothing minus nothing. So you say, well, Brother Spurgeon, you know, we're saved. We're all saved. Well, maybe you are. Maybe you're not. But I know this. Some of you at home aren't. And you need to be and you can be. God saved somebody like me. How are you going to have any excuse? And I'll tell you for those of you that are. Uh, you got in on it. You got in on the gift of eternal life. But I'm going to tell you something else. You know somebody that hasn't yet. We've got friends. We've got relatives. We've got coworkers. We've got neighbors that we pass by every day. And they're clueless. And we're not clueless. And therefore, we're responsible. So we need to get in our Bible. We need to rejoice in our salvation. We need to ask the Lord for opportunities. And they're out there. This ain't hard to do. Amen? And uh, surrender ourselves, like it says in Psalm tw uh, Romans 12. It's just reasonable. And ask the Lord, let us be a vessel meet for the master's use. Say, wow, that's really deep. Did you think all that up? I didn't think any of it up. It's right there. Father, I love you this morning. And I pray and ask God you'd encourage this congregation. Stick by the stuff. Continue to be faithful. Being ever mindful, you are faithful and are still. Thank you for the privilege to be here, and I pray and ask that you bless the invitation time, the food to follow, the evening, the afternoon service. Uh, just, God, may we be found faithful when you come, and we pray that soon. Thou knowest the time. Help us to do our part. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm giving it. If you have, uh, if you're in the book of Philippians, look at chapter 2, starting in verse 14. I'll read down to 16. The Bible says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Of course, like he said earlier, I, I know that, that, that Paul probably wasn't no Baptist. But anyway, verse 15, he says, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So there are responsibilities, amen. And then it comes comes with the question, I would imagine, like over time, because I remember when we first got saved, it I didn't know how to why you guys how you got to that point. I knew that you got to that point. I saw that you there. I I, I envied, maybe that's not the right word. I respected, that's a better word. I respected the men in church because my life, I had no men around me. I had all sorts of wickedness around me. Guys that said they were, but they, they, they were not. And then, you know, young ladies and stuff. So I saw how the Christian moms work and Christian dads work and Christian husbands work and the Christian wives work. And just that, and because we didn't grow up in church like that. And so it was like, so how do you get to that point? How do you how do you get to where you could just walk through life without all this murmuring, this fear that you could be blameless and harmless? You know, identifying the sons of God that that you're without rebuke in this wicked world, this crooked and perverse nation. And make no mistake about it, your nation is crooked and perverse. This is, this is a wicked world, man. Anyone get into all that? And then we're supposed to shine light and as lights, as it says. How do I get to that? And then verse sixteen explains that, like he was preaching. You hold forth the word of life. You hold it. You, 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 you embrace it. You can't do it without the word of God. The words of God. You cannot do You will never, ever, ever be anything than an empty shell for Jesus Christ outside of your ability or allowing the Holy Spirit of God to take the words of truth and pull them inside you, amen, and you work out your salvation. You work it from the inside out. You can't do it. If you don't protect what God's given you, if you don't nurture what God's given you, if you don't have the desire where, where there's a will, there's a way. You will never amount to anything for Jesus Christ. You'll be going through motions till the day God takes you home and you're going to regret everything at the judgment seat of Christ. Our role isn't to present some Christianity that's impossible. That's not our role. Right. We're trying to tell you, look, yeah, it comes with a fight, but everything in life comes with a fight. Not and so when you sell out to that, you just, we're just trying to tell you what's worth fighting for. And boy, showing up to a Bible-believing church house in the middle of, you know, a dry and thirsty land to hear that word. And oftentimes, you know what, we'd say, well, I've heard that before. Right, and you need to be reminded. 
And you mean to be reminded how great God is, but you won't do it outside of the word of God. It'll be your opinion. God forbid you're getting it from the chosen and all that ridiculousness that goes on. You're going to let that Roman Catholic Jesus guy with the, you know, with the X on his head that has the, the little app that all the sucker Christians are downloading. And now he got you praying the rosaries, the rosary. That's America. That's the American Christianity. You want to know, like he said earlier, he said, you know, what? we always had sodomites. Yeah, we did. They show up in uh, Genesis 13, 13. So they've been around. They hadn't been out of the closet in the United States like they're at, right, right. like they do now. And they're not, they were never in the school. Your public schools invite those things in there. Your public schools got to the point now. They kicked that, that, that God, got out of there. It didn't take from 63 to now. Boy, that whole thing. I mean, you started like that decoration thing was in 1776. And you had a lot of victory in America. A lot of souls got saved in America. There are a lot of evangelists and preachers and Christians called to do wonderful things in this country. And it didn't take long for the whole thing to unravel. Now Christians themselves, they don't know if they're coming or going. You don't know if you're committed to what. You are committed to Netflix, apparently. You're, you're, you're lovers of pleasure, apparently. Oh, man, we got a great God. You, you, you've got relationships? We'll, we'll get in the book, Hold Forth the Words of Life. You want a better wife? You want a better better marriage? I tell you guys, we tell you guys historically, you know what? What 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 constitutes 30 plus years, like how many? 34? Five? <coughs> 34 years of marriage, five saved kids. How do you how do you where do you attribute that? Well, hold holding forth the words of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We figured out years ago after we got say how important that, that book is in our lives. That book tells us to be faithful. That book tells me how to how to take care of her, how to be the man. And then when I'm off kilter, like once in a very long time ago, some of you, I know how to get things right with God. How'd you get that? I got from that book. But oh boy, if you if you just trying to, you know, it's time for church and then it's all, you know, let's go find, where's my Bible, honey? Where's my Bible? It's probably where you left it on the floor somewhere, study, you know, uh, uh, put away somewhere in some shelf. Amen. Amen, bro. And we've got a great little thing going on here. Just take advantage of the fact. Why? Because your life's but a vapor. You appear for a short time and then it vanishes the way and you have one chance to serve Jesus Christ. You're saved. We got that settled. Yeah. You understand about eternal security? Mm -hmm. We were learning how to rally divide the word of truth. Yeah. What you doing with it? You're neglecting your salvation. You're not careful. And then, boy, it'd be like, man, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? Yeah, what happened to him? He's gone. Oh, wow, he had a lot of potential, man. I'm sorry that happened. And as soon as you step out of this body, there's no going back. God don't make mistakes. Your appointment with death, however that works, the rapture kicking off. I'm like, man, even so come Lord Jesus. Look, man, I'm, 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 I'm into that. Let's get out of here, stuff. There's nothing in this world that 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 that, that you benefit from. There's nothing. Most of ninety nine point nine percent of everything that goes on in this world keeps you from Jesus Christ. Keeps you from that Bible. Waste all your time. It, it it provides you with all sorts of levels of excuse why you can't be the light. This is a crooked and perverse generation, man. And and now it doesn't bother them telling you that they tell you to your face they're crooked and perverse and you're celebrating and that nfl you know what they're doing during the super bowl week that you're gonna have pastors all over america come super bowl sunday they're gonna cut their pm service off god forbid or they're gonna have it and they're gonna bring that stinking television in there they're gonna have a fellowship hall type thing i already know how it works Man, that thing has one of them days set aside leading up to that game. They have all sorts of festivities, right? Just like Rome, just like the, the typical nonsense, the pagan Amer pagan garbage, heathen garbage. <clears throat> one of those days are specifically set aside for them sodomites. Yeah, I don't remember as a kid watching the Cowboys and all them sodomite stuff going on. I don't remember that. I don't remember school shooters coming into our schools. Man, I don't remember none of that. I don't remember it just being wide open like it is today. And you got an opportunity, man, to be a peculiar, saved individual. But you got to have a will to do it. You got to want what God has for you. That's right. And then you do, man. Just enjoy our Christianity. You got good people. Not everybody got all these. There's 3 million people in Dade County. There's about 20 people that are showing up here, and we'll do it. And they say, oh, well, well, well you're belittling the fact. No, I already know. There was only, if these are the days of Lot and the days of Noah, 
there was only eight that got on the ark, so I'm not sure where it would, like, you know, there would be 20,000. No, it said eight. And he said, what about, what about Lot? Two, three, actually. And he had to be drug out. So I get what time it is. Glory to God for you, man. Let's, let's finish strong. Let's, let's, let's do right. I got preaching. You know, we enjoy ourselves. We'll, we'll, we'll ask the Lord to bless the food. Let's take what you know to take, right? Praying God asks you to help you read that Bible more consistently, Lord, speak, uh, you know, and speak to you. And enjoy your Christianity. Go tell somebody about Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Invite them to church. We got a little church here, amen. We got tracks here. We, I've ordered more tracks. We're going to go street preaching next week. We go do quite a bit, actually. But, you know, if they're not a church service, if there's not an activity there, something that's organized, you still got you, though. You go tell them. I, like he said, I, you're going to run into people. I don't know. I'm not in your circle like that. You got people that you're going to show that on Mondays tomorrow, right? You got a Monday like everybody else has a Monday, and you got to see some people on your Monday that is a very good uh, very good chance they ain't saved. And boy, pray for them, man. They're going to be in hell thinking of you. Man, how can we never cussing your name out? Be careful. The rich man in hell, he's preaching. He's asking people, Lord, if there's somebody, he's asking for supernatural people rising up from the dead, knocking on the door type stuff. He's so concerned about souls. Right. Well, can you imagine we were so concerned we were into supernatural kind of intervention on our neighbor? We don't even pray for the guy. We don't even talk to the guy. We'd never give him a track. Give him a track. Talk to him. Enjoy your salvation. Jesus Christ saves, man. He saved you. Saved me. I, I enjoy this stuff. I, I want more of it. Thank you. Father, bless the day. We thank you for it. Thank you for being saved, Lord. Thank you for that precious blood. Thank you for dying for us, Lord, taking the full price of our sin, being buried, and, and unlike Muhammad and Confucius and Elvis and Tupac and all them not all that nonsense, Lord, you came up up to the third day, Lord, to pay the full price for our sin. Lord, bless the fellowship. We got one last meeting, well, one last rather uh, service. We'll eat and uh, we'll enjoy some fellowship. And uh, we love and thank you. We plead the blood. Bet you come soon. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.